Canada is known for being a country with some of the nicest people on the planet. Even so, a country with a good reputation can have dark secrets. One of Canada's dirty little secrets are starlight tours. A starlight tour is a practice that involves a police officer driving an indigenous person to city outskirts and leaving them there to walk home in the dead of winter. Officers have been said to pick up drunk or rowdy people and drop them off in the middle of nowhere. This almost certainly leads to death. A Canadian winter can be brutal, even to those who are used to Canada's most frigid temperatures. How long this has been going on is unknown. What has been discovered is the first survivor from a starlight tour. These tours have been known to some, but not proven to be true until the winter of the year 2000. On January 28, 2000, two police officers drove Daryl Knight from outside of his uncle's apartment, five kilometers outside of Saskatoon, and left him in 22 degrees below Celsius weather, right before dawn. He was wearing just a t-shirt, jean jacket, and running shoes. Daryl had been drinking and was involved in a quarrel. Yelling and shouting obscenities is common when people get drunk. So the police being called and someone being arrested for disorderly conduct and having to spend the night in jail is not unusual. Daryl thought that that would happen to him. Instead, the cops drove out of town and took him to an isolated spot three miles outside Saskatoon. The authorities did a little cursing of their own at him. Daryl, a member of the Cree Nation, recalled one of the officers saying a derogatory term for indigenous people to him. Get the blank out of here, you blank blank. His face was slammed on the hood of the trunk, the handcuffs were removed, and he was standing alone on a riverbank. He yelled, I'll freeze out here. What's wrong with you guys? A voice echoed back to him in the cold. That's your blank problem. Daryl watched the car drive off, its lights trailing out of sight eventually. He was all alone with the wind whipping around him. In Saskatchewan, there can be sudden blizzards and temperatures may drop to 40 degrees below zero. With the odds against him, he thought there was no way he would survive such an ordeal. Yet, he didn't give up. He started walking. He was determined because he would have been one more dead indigenous person, a victim of what had become known as the Midnight Blue Tour, a body found on the outskirts of Saskatoon with no witnesses and only a dead man's story to tell. Survival instincts kicked in and Daryl was able to make it several miles to the Queen Elizabeth Power Station where a watchman let him in from out in the cold. Daryl's story spread awareness of the depraved activities of the city's police force. At least five frozen bodies of Aboriginal men have been found in the same area. There had always been rumors that the police were responsible, but there was no proof until night made it back alive. The community was outraged. Daryl began receiving death threats. Since then, hundreds of other Aboriginal people from across Canada have come forward and called the Native Law Center at the University of Saskatchewan to tell their stories of abuse. Unfortunately, Daryl's experience didn't stop more deaths from occurring. Within days of Daryl's ordeal, the bodies of Rodney Nastis and Lawrence Wegner were discovered on the outskirts of Saskatoon. Rodney, a 25-year-old, was found January 29th in an industrial area just north of the power plant. Lawrence was a 30-year-old student at Federated College and was found in a field on February 3rd near the Queen Elizabeth II power plant. The public outcry from Aboriginal and anti-racism groups in Saskatchewan forced an independent investigation. Rodney and Lawrence's cause of death was ruled to be hypothermia. The investigation brought about a set of recommendations related to police policies and indigenous police relations. 10 years before Darrell's harrowing encounter with the police, 
In 1990, Salto Creek First Nation teenager, 17-year-old Neil Stonechild, was taken for a starlight tour. Neil was the second youngest child in his family. He was well-liked and came from a church-going family. He was active in sports and church activities. He was an avid wrestler, working hard to improve his skills and even trying to teach his friends. His family moved from Manitoba to Saskatoon in 1980. He came from a military family. Neil admired his older brother Marcel and joined the cadets with him. His older sister Erica said he loved it. As he grew older, Neil and his friends started drinking. His sister said he didn't drink often, and months before he died, he told his family he was ending relationships with people who were getting in trouble. He wanted to focus on his future. He had his whole life ahead of him, a life full of possibilities and promise. Neil was robbed of his future one fateful night in 1990. On November 24th, Neil Stonechild and his friend Jason Roy left the house party shortly before midnight while it was storming in 25 degrees below Celsius weather. Jason was stopped by city police constables Brad Singer and Larry Hartwig. Jason details that the last time he saw Neil alive, cops had Neil in the back seat of their cruiser and Neil was bloodied, screaming for help, and yelling that the police were going to kill him. On November 29th, five days later, Neil's body was discovered by workers in the underdeveloped industrial 800th block of 57th Street. He was face down wearing a light jacket, jeans, and one of his shoes was missing. Sergeant Keith Jarvis of the Morality Unit was assigned to the case. December 3rd, Neil's funeral was held at Westwood Funeral Chapel, where his family observed two parallel cuts on the bridge of his nose. Jarvis concluded the file. He did not address why Neil was missing a shoe, how he could have walked nine kilometers to an industrial area in a snowstorm, or what had caused the cuts on his nose in his report. Neil's friend Jason's statement that he saw Neil in the back of Singer and Hartwell's cruiser is omitted from the report also. Instead, the report said, the kid went out, got drunk, went for a walk, and froze to death. Neil's death is particularly tragic for Neil's older brother, Chris, who had only been reunited with his younger brother, Neil, and family in recent years after being in the foster care system and living outside of Saskatchewan. He and Neil made an immediate connection with one another. They had not been raised together, but shared a solid bond over their love for wrestling. Chris remembers Neil as many others as a fun-loving and very caring. He loved messing with him. He was a great kid and great brother. He loved life. Neil was wearing the letterman jacket Chris had given him when he was found in the field. Neil's mother talked about the jacket during the inquiry into his death. The jacket had particular importance to his brother Chris. Neil treasured it and Chris gave it to him before leaving for a trip to Ontario. After the investigation, Chris went to the police to request Neil's belongings, including the jacket which held significant sentimental value to him. The Saskatoon police told him they couldn't find it. Chris said that he didn't know if any of this had ever been told, but they couldn't find any of his stuff. The jacket and Neil's other possessions were never returned. Chris's mother was heartbroken. The police ignored the case for years after that. March 4, 1991, Star Phoenix journalist Terry Craig reports that Neil's mother and his sister disagree with Jarvis's report and suspect foul play. In 1998, the original Saskatoon police file of the investigation into Neil's death is destroyed during a routine purge of old files. Years later, after Daryl Knight survived being left for dead in the snow, there was a public outcry from Aboriginal people. 
Native Canadians had been mistreated by police officers for an untold number of years. Roughly 75% of the male prison population and 90% of the female prison population is Aboriginal, according to government st statistics. Government commissions were held to address these concerns. Aboriginal advocacy groups began pressing for charges, calling for community relations programs aimed at reducing the number of arrests. The Native Law Center made an effort to educate Aboriginals on the law and encourage them to become lawyers or work to defend civil rights. It is believed that as a result of these changes, certain police officers decided to deal with the problem of Aboriginal people by their own methods. They started just dropping Indigenous people off instead of booking them. In 2001, the International Human Rights Organization, Amnesty International, released a report criticizing Canada police for patterns of police abuse against First Nation Aboriginal men in Saskatoon. The police who dropped Daryl off in the middle of nowhere, Dan Hatchkin and Ken Munson, were convicted of un unlawful confinement in September 2001 and sentenced to eight months in prison. During the trial, the officers testified that they didn't break any laws and that Daryl was never assaulted. But individually, they gave different accounts of what had happened that night. Hatchin's attorney said the officer's defense was that Daryl asked to be dropped off on the edge of town. He claimed he was well known to the police who had dealt with him before and Daryl told him to drop him off anywhere. Just don't take him in and charge him. Munson's attorney denied racism was the motive for the drop-off. He claimed there have been other individuals around Saskatchewan who said they have been dropped off by different police forces. Some are Aboriginal, some are not. Prosecutor Bill Burge argued that they deviated from what the criminal code tells them what to do and, what, and did what they wanted to do. At that point, the confinement of Daryl Knight became unlawful because they're not taking him to the police station. The officers were fired after their convictions. Saskatchewan's justice minister ordered a review into the treatment of Native Canadians in the justice system. After Rodney Nastis and Lawrence Wagner were found, the minister of justice ordered inquests into their into those and other deaths. An inquest does not determine guilt of innocence, but is held to establish where and when a death occurred and the medical cause of death. Inquests are open to the public and evidence is heard by a six member jury, which also makes recommendations on how similar deaths can be prevented. The inquest in Rodney and Lawrence deaths found the circumstances were inconclusive. The report on Lawrence said that he was found in a field and the cause of death was hypothermia from prolonged exposure. By what means? Undetermined. The inquest jury recommended the development of a standing order requiring police officers to record in their notebooks the names of individuals they take into their police vehicles for whatever reason. Other cases. 53-year-old Lloyd Dusty Horn was found frozen to death in Saskatoon on January 19, 2000, the day after he had been taken into custody by police for a public intoxication. The inquest jury decided in, in May that his death was caused by hypothermia. 33-year-old Darcy Dean Ironchild died on February 19, 2000, after he was taken into custody for public intoxication. On February 18th, the Saskatchewan Justice Department claimed he was released around midnight and sent home in a taxi. The inquest jury said Darcy's death was accidental and the cause of overdose. The cause was overdose of chloral hydrate, an old and rarely used sedative, most famously combined with alcohol without the drinker's knowledge to make a Mickey fan. Mickey Finn is named after bartender Michael Mickey Finn, who was a bartender at the Lone Star Saloon and Palm Garden restaurant in Chicago from 1896 to 1903. 
He used chloral hydrates and alcohol to drug and rob his customers. The cases of Daryl Knight, Rodney Nastis, Lawrence Wagner, Laura Dusty Horn, and Darcy Ironchild prompted a new inquest in 2003 into the death of Neil Stonechild. At the time of his death, Neil's aunt and sister noticed bruises on his face. His aunt said there was a cut across the bridge of his nose that extended to his cheek and makeup didn't hide. It was obvious that he had been beaten up. His uncle said that he noticed bumps on Neil's head and skin missing on his wrists, thumbs, and hands. He thought the scratches looked like they came from pulling at handcuffs. The police reported no signs of foul play and the coroner said he examined the body but did not notice any scratches on the face. October 26, 2004, the final report of Neil Stonechild's inquest finds that Neil was in the custody of Larry Hartwig and Bradley Singer on the night he died, and the injuries on his nose were likely made by handcuffs. Initially, initially Singer and Hartwig were suspended. November 2004, Singer and Hartwig were, are fired. The investigation was unable to conclude what the circumstances surrounding Neil's death were. Hartwig and Sinjar argued their innocence and said they did not have contact with Neil that night. Evidence to the contrary was presented. Hartwig and Sinjar appealed. Their appeals were rejected. Starlight tours, starlight cruises, or a midnight rise sounds like a pleasant time. In reality, they are anything but for the Aboriginal people of Canada and perhaps some others. Who knows for sure how long some police officers have been committing this appalling practice. Some have been recorded as early as 1976, the most well-known incident in 1990. Ever since the Neil Stonechild investigation, the Saskatoon police have claimed to continue to move forward on positive work regarding relations between the police and Indigenous Canadians. There are still calls for reform. There is still much work to be done. Hopefully, we won't hear about any more Starlight tours. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching.